all go ahead and take your seats for the moment. I want to welcome you all and, and thank you for joining us this evening. And on behalf of the family of Dundalk Baptist Church, I want to thank you all who are here, who are in the overflow room, who are watching online as we remember Stephen and honor him. And I do thank you for how many have showed up. Uh, and I need to remind you, because of uh, how many are here, that we do have a few fire exits that I need to make you aware of just in case something happens. So you can go out the door that you just came in. You can also go out this door right here and take a right in the double doors. You can get outside that way. And then through this door up here will lead you into an office that has a door to the outside there. Um, well, I'm thankful that we can gather this evening to remember Stephen and to honor him, and I would like to just open in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can be here to remember your servant Stephen, who lived for you, whose heart was to magnify Christ in all that he did, who loved his family and his community, and Lord, while we are sorrowful, while we grieve, while we feel the pain of loss, we know that he is enjoying your presence and that he would be rather be nowhere else. Lord, we want to honor you this day. We want to honor Stephen's memory. We ask that you would help us to do that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to begin by reading a passage of scripture. Uh, Tim is going to come up. He is a member of Dundalk Baptist Church, and he's going to read from Job chapter 19. Oh, 
inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Amen. I'm going to ask you all to stand as we sing our first song, which is a song called In Christ Alone. experiencing a parting in this world was attended to as we were, the impact of death in this life would be met with less sorrow. While God blessed us with the time to spend with Dad before he passed, there was a palpable sense that an entire community was softening and slowing our fall into grief from the constant physical and emotional support of our beloved families on Mam and Dad's side 
to having every need met by this church, to the incredibly gentle touch of the entire staff at Bon Secours Dublin, and perhaps most importantly, the prayers of hundreds around the world. Thank you to you all, and please don't stop praying for our strength. Dad was a man that meant so much to so many. While Bernard would come up and encourage us with tales from the life of Stephen, the brother, some of which had us in stitches these last few days, I can speak to my experience of Stephen, the father, and Stephen, the pastor. I have many great memories of Dad when we were young. Swing to serve him. Rock and sun his knee. I remember how much he loved showering us with gifts and how much Christmas meant to him as a time for tradition, family, and a time when the world paused to remember Jesus. But some of my best memories were of Dad and Mam taking Dad and myself on trips all over Ireland and the UK. Whether camping or staying with friends, there was always time to visit local historic sites and museums. History was important to him, and he wanted to impart on us its lessons. Even on holiday, there were lessons to be learned. I never begrudged it, because it nurtured a different way of looking at the world. The beauty of the landscape was a way to appreciate God's hand in its design. The mysteries of a ruined castle held a lesson on the folly of man's self-importance compared to eternity. A museum was full of lessons on leadership or analogies that could be drawn to biblical stories to show how predictable humanity was or the importance of being grounded in biblical truth to stop civilizations sliding into decay. He taught us a way to appreciate everything we see in the proper eternal context. The first few times we went to the States, he reveled in learning as much as he could about places he'd never been, but perhaps visited by Lincoln or Washington or even John Wayne. For all his very obvious faults, there was something liberating about life over there that matched his outlook. Less regulation, less bureaucracy, a system that acknowledged man is just very poor at governing himself. My father was a well-educated man in both worldly and biblical things, and we were lucky enough to have him as our tour guide. Dad spent his whole life studying and learning. It led him to be a confident man. He almost had an air of aristocracy to him as he walked, chin held high, hands behind his back, along the Strahand Road and up Castle Lane every day. But behind that visible confidence was a true servant. He knew his role in this life, and he was confident and relaxed in it. He was a leader, but a servant leader. While it's important to look after yourself mentally and physically, which you did, it's also important to always place yourself as the least important person in the room in your own eyes. He always taught us in word and deed to be humble and to serve others. I remember so many times I had to leave late at night or travel for days. Dad would do anything in service of anyone who reached out to him, church members or strangers. We'd be left at the house sometimes no idea who needed him. Families and pastors know how that feels. As a child, it was always hard to understand, but as an adult, I couldn't be prouder of his dedication. Man would always remind us of the importance of his work to both the people being helped and the spread of the gospel. She'd lose her best friend in an instant to someone that called in crisis. But her faith was that God was working every situation for his purpose, even when we couldn't see what that was. Now, we know that it was to save a marriage, or more often than we knew, somebody's life. Mam's faithful understanding and support was a rock for him that allowed him to fight for this church and was an incredible education to me and Daniel. As a soldier, I now know too well the feeling of leaving my beloved family to aid others. To an untrained eye, it looks as if what's calling you to service is more important than your family, but uh, that is to misunderstand what you see. It is the love of the family that makes the sacrifice harder and sacrifice it was. Such is the life of true Christianity. Servant leadership is what Christ embodied and what he demanded of those that would follow him. In Matthew 20, Jesus was talking to his disciples about this and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. These last few days were the culmination of our lessons as a father and pastor to us all. He lived a life in service to God and everyone here. When Daniel and I arrived to the hospital earlier this week, 
There was a man clearly ready to shed his mortal coil and receive his eternal reward. However, despite all his knowledge and learning and faithful service, he was insistent that none of that was his comfort. He would not be in heaven because he was a pastor or because he was a good man. His message was that Christianity at its core is simple. There would be no balance of good deeds or bad deeds in front of an eternal judge. All he had to do was rely on the perfect life and sacrifice of Christ and that alone. Ephesians 2 says, sorry, Ephesians 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one could boast. If you want to be as confident as my father was at the end, that's the secret. My father will be remembered by each of us and how we relate to him and the many ways we love him. Some of us as his family, some as members of the church, some as his associates and some as his friends. He excelled in all those areas and his incredible impact will be missed. I love my father, we love my father, but no doubt he would want to be remembered by us above all else as a good and faithful servant of Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. So I hope for everyone here that in his honor, you go for long walks, drink in God's creation, stay healthy, and carry yourself with that same air of confidence that when he comes, when you trust God's forgiven you, and will keep you up to that last day. Young Stephen, as we have always called him, asked me if I would say a few words as um, Stephen's senior's only sibling as such. And we have to stop calling me Young Stephen now anymore. <laughs> you would be elevated Stephen um, as such. So I suppose um, I'm just uh, saying a few words off the cuff, um, and I would just say at the beginning, I think as Stephen has said, all of this is still very raw for us. Um, as such, so um, I ask for your understanding if it gets a little bit pear shaped. As such, um, everybody who's here today, and there's a huge crowd obviously, and there are people next door, and there are people joining us online, and especially Clark and Sheila Lowry, who is known to obviously many of this community, and who we all consider as very close friends, as such. So, everybody, as there are people here, there are family, there are friends, there are neighbours, there are mem members of this uh, church community. As such, and my only claim to fame is as uh, Stephen's only sister, as such, and it's in that, I suppose, um, realm that I, I'm talking to you. I'm not going to tell all the stories that we spoke about, Stephen, <laughs> uh, or, or whatever. Also, I suppose the last few days brought us all together, um, those many long hours in the bonds or whatever, and in the family room, and that's really, and we chatted about uh, Stephen growing up, and, and that's really that it was a whole life, probably. Uh, maybe 20 years before, maybe meeting Marie and, and moving in, into another stage in his life, as it were. And uh, he was a year and a half older than me, so I suppose I grew up in his shadow um, as such. He was kind of the protector, and I suppose as I said to somebody when we became teenagers, if I wanted to go somewhere, I'd only be allowed to go if he was going, so I'd have to sort of sweeten him all week as such. Because <laughs> he wasn't a real dancing man as such. As, as those of you who, who knew him, as it were. But in fairness, he always obliged and, and suffered in silence um, uh, as such. Uh, we grew up in a small village, and many of you have visited that over the last uh, few days in Anagas. Um, we grew up, as I say, late 50s, 60s, as such, and in rural Ireland, as, uh, as such. We were in a, in a working class family. Um, as such, our parents, we had wonderful parents who put us as their priority gave us lots of opportunities, probably at the expense of maybe little luxuries that they could have had in life. As such, uh, they were intent that we would get a good education. Uh, and as children, we got extras such as music, speech and drama, and even art classes. And I think maybe people didn't realize, but Stephen was actually quite an accomplished artist. I had to go and do whatever he did, as it were. But uh, even as an 11-year-old, he would have um, 
produced uh, very good oil paintings and things like that. I don't think he pursued it in latter life, but it was a wonderful talent he has. So maybe boys now that there might be uh, there might be something in the genes there that you haven't discovered yet. Um, we grew up, there were only eight, eight houses on our road and the farm road at that time. Now there are probably maybe 50 houses or whatever. But there were only, and there were, of the eight houses, there were only uh, three houses that were children in as such. There was the O'Neill family who are represented here today, the Callan family and ourselves. And as kids in the 60s, there were no PlayStations or anything like that. We made our, all, our own fun, we invented games, we played. I don't think we fought very much as such, I think we had, but we had a good time and most of all, I think we developed relationships that have lasted for all these years, I say, I won't say how many, but you can guess anyway, uh, as such. So that was our life, I suppose, growing up in, in a small community as such. Uh, as teenagers, um, the, I suppose living in the country, you didn't have maybe the access to cinemas on a regular basis that you have in, in, in towns or in cities or wherever. And there was a, an organisation formed in Ireland in the 60s called Munchen Nachira. The people of the country is, is probably the, the, um, the translation of such. And it was basically to provide, I suppose, activities for people in rural areas. And that was very strong in our own parish uh, growing up. And there's, it really consisted of having uh, weekly sort of debates, question times, uh, talent competitions, variety shows, that sort of thing. And then teams from each a rural area or parish would have competitions with each other, as it were. And uh, Stephen was very, very involved in that. Um, and he was particularly good, even at that age, at debating as such. And I suppose that's something that maybe brought him in after life when he became a pastor and did preaching. And I know that he was invited as guest speakers to various conferences in the United States and in various places and that sort of thing. So it's certainly something probably that he built on in, in those days as it were. He was also good in the talent shows. I'm not sure if uh, if uh, the, the guys knew that uh, as it were. And he took part once in the production, uh, Philadelphia Here I Come by Brian Friel. It was a famous play about um, a young man, I suppose, being torn on the eve of him going to the United States between the, the pain of leaving home and the prospect of a better life um, abroad, uh, as it were. So the, he, he liked the, the, he treaded the boards and the stage a little bit as well, as such. Academically, Stephen was very, he was very good. He was very bright from a very early age, as such. Um, he skated through primary school, as it were. He went to uh, CBS or Colosh as it would be called now. And then in, uh, I think it was probably in 1973, he went to UCD um, as such. And not many people went, I suppose, to university in those days as such. He um, had, a, a, I suppose, a, an academic ability as such. He, interestingly enough, when I was reading some of the comments on RIP.ie, there was one from, I think, who, who, the first friend he made in UCD, which may be known to many of you, a guy called Leo Enright. He's, um, he's a fairly renowned uh, broadcaster and uh, particularly in all matters of science and space, both in RTE and BBC. And I think he's head of the um, commission, uh, the government commission on, on space or whatever. But he made a lovely comment about his memories of Stephen and that even at that age he was his the qualities of compassion and caring were there where he looked after students who maybe found the transition of moving from rural areas to uh, the city or wherever, missing home or wherever, and that he carried that into lateral life with him in the ministry, in, in the ministry here for the last uh, 35 years um, as such. He would later then, I suppose, he, he, he uh, pursued then a degree at a later time in economics and uh, politics and uh, history as such, and he was a great lover of history. He was also involved in politics, and I know there are some people here, the O'Hares have memories of him being involved in politics or whatever, and many people, I think, maybe felt that he would have, he would have developed a career in politics, and I think probably could have been uh, quite successful in that area, but he chose um, a different, uh, different path. Um, he, uh, he followed it up then to a uh, uh, graduate in, in librarianship. He was always a bookworm, he loved books or whatever. And he pursued a career for a period of time in the library services, both in County Loud and in Dublin. And he took the big decision then, I suppose, at that later stage where he was going to devote his life to the church 
and I can always remember my mother, you know, sort of giving up a good permanent pensionable job as such. You can just imagine sort of somebody of that year, you know, whatever. And uh, but he followed, uh, he followed, I suppose, his dream as it were. This was what he wanted to do, and was fundamental in establishing this church here in Dundalk and the. the the venture purchase of this property and, and, and all that went with that, as it were. And, and my mother, indeed, was, my mother was a Catholic and a very devout Catholic, but she attended many services here and she was very proud of him and, um, and the way life you know, turned out for him and Marie and, 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 and the boys as such. Um, I suppose, you know, he retired at the beginning of the year and I wondered, you know, gosh, you know, what is he going to do? And I know he had great plans and he was going to spend a lot of time with the boys and with their families in, in the States, as it were. Unfortunately, that wasn't to be. And, and life changed significantly for us over the last um, couple of weeks and as such. Um, I, like Stephen mentioned, you know, I uh, suppose what life was like in their home, which I didn't really understand either. I just felt, well, he's a pastor or whatever. But, you know, I suppose the stories I heard from people, I met so many of you coming to uh, the Bond Secures to visit him over, over that week or week and a half or whatever, and the stories of how he touched your lives, how he saved your lives. Um, or whenever, and I wasn't, I wasn't really aware of, of, of that aspect of, of his work. So he really did spend, I suppose, like 35 years, you know, in, in the service of, of the Lord, in the very best way, because, and, and the practical side as well, and we all know that loving our neighbour as ourselves, as it were, and he certainly gave testimony, testimony to that. Um, du during his time. And he wasn't all serious, he was in a great joker and he had a great sense of humour and um, he had that right through childhood as such and even in, in the latter days in the hospital as such um, that was very, very evident and that in some of the stories while well, he was still, he was still uh, telling us uh, whatever about, about that or whatever. Um, I suppose um, when I heard the news initially, I wondered, well, how am I going to actually deal with this and meet him or whatever? But I mightn't have worried because straight away he was putting me at ease. He made it very clear this is God's plan for him. He fully accepted it or whatever. His life was, or his work was done, as it were. And I described to somebody, the last week in the hospital, he travelled very light as such. His, his bags were packed and he was ready to go. Um, and that made it so much easier for us. It didn't make uh, the heartbreak any better, but it made it easier that you know that he was he was so happy. He was so happy to go um, as such. Um, I want to thank Marie because um, as my sister in law, she always looked after him as such. And uh, but in in those last weeks, you know the strength that she had for him and particularly before the boys were able to make it home or wherever she held the fourth and it was one week he was in isolation because of a potential infection so she was really on her own with him for that week so you know it was a tough week or whatever and i want to thank her for for, for her commitment to him i'd also like to thank the members of the church here people i know people i don't know uh, for their support and certainly their support over the last number of days it was absolutely fantastic. And um, I suppose his good deeds go before him, and I suppose it, it, it was very easy in one sense because, you know, he was so content about what he had done, or sorry, about, about meeting, meeting, the, meeting the Lord as such, um, and that he had, he had given his life to him or whatever. And uh, I suppose finally I'm using an analogy that anyone who knows the Shadows know we're a football family as such. And um, the advice usually given to somebody playing a, a, a game of football, if it's an important game of football, is maybe a final or whatever. People say, leave it all on the field. In other words, you do the very best you can on that day. You can't be accountable for what your teammates do or the fact that the other team may be better than you in the first one off or whatever. But people say, leave it all on the field, as it were. And in my mind, Stephen left it all and feel. Thank you very much.
I'm going to ask uh, Marguerite to come up. She's a member of the Dock Baptist Church, and she's going to read a passage from John 11. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. I ask that you go ahead and stand as we sing another song. This song is called Love with Everlasting Love. Stephen, Daniel, Bernadette, all the family, 
uh, you will very much remain in our prayers. And you can be confident that there are many people who are praying for you this day and will continue to pray for you. And you have our sincere sympathy at the loss of Stephen. Although, as you've been so positive about it, it's a loss, but for him it's a gain. And uh, that is something that you genuinely hold to and believe. Um, I had the privilege of knowing Stephen um, from the mid-80s. Um, I was the pastor in Uri Baptist Church at that time. And uh, Jimmy McComb, one of the older members of Uri Baptist Church, travelled up and down to Dundalk quite a lot for all kinds of services. If there was a church meeting on anywhere, Jimmy McComb was at it and I usually got dragged along and that included meeting a group of people who were meeting here in Dundalk and uh, sometimes met in houses, sometimes met in garages and in other places and we had the privilege of sharing together in uh, the gospel right back from then and watching um, the development not just of Stephen as a, as a pastor but also uh, of this church and when the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Philippi he said to them, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And certainly that is my memory of Stephen, uh, of being able to be a partner in the gospel with him in those very early days here in the establishment of the witness uh, in the dock, in the establishment of this church formally as a Baptist church. And I said, I, mean, I had the privilege of preaching at Stephen's retirement just earlier this year, and one of the, the comments I made, which I, I want to make again, is that I think his ministry was really quite remarkable. He spent 35 years as the pastor of this church. Now, pastoral ministry of that length and duration isn't very common these days. But the thing that's particularly striking about it is it was 35 years spent in his own community, in his own town, amongst his own people. That's exceedingly rare. And that meant that Stephen ministered in an environment where people knew him, they knew his background, they knew uh, his strengths and his weaknesses. It's the place he stayed. Uh, Stephen would never have claimed never to have made a mistake. But he stayed here, he lived in this environment, and he lived openly before people. And that, I think, is a great witness and a great testimony to his sense of God's call upon his life, to this community, to this town, to this people, to his own people. And I think that's something that we really want to honour again this morning, as we remember Stephen and give thanks for his life and for his ministry. And Stephen was a man of faith, of that there is no doubt. That faith was very evident in the closing hours of his life, the closing days of his life, where his focus was still very much on helping everyone else keep their focus on Jesus. And that was very clear. But he was a man of faith in practical ways too. I remember the first time he invited me to come and look at this building with him. And um, this building, when it was purchased, looked nothing like it looks now, I can assure you. And I have to say, I thought, I thought he was biting off more than he could chew. <laughs> I thought he was taking the small church somewhere that might just be a wee bit difficult. O oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> uh, because he had a strong sense that this was the place, this was the provision that God was going to make. And so many years later here we stand and bear witness to that leadership. And to that sense of confidence, not in himself and not in his ability to raise the money to do this or whatever, because that was an impossible task. It was his sense of confidence that this was God's leading, and that was true of his life. If he felt God was leading him somewhere, then that's the path he wanted to walk. I'm very conscious today, too, that there are many of his fellow pastors here, and they, too, will be able to bear witness to Stephen's faithfulness, not just to the church here in Dundalk, but to the community of pastors that he was part of and to the community of churches that he served. For many years, uh, Stephen was on the Council of the Association of Baptist Churches in Ireland and on the executive of the Association of Baptist Churches in Ireland and served very faithfully and held the presidency of the association uh, at one point as well. So Stephen was very highly regarded, not just by the church community here, 
but very highly regarded by the Association of Churches across the island. And that is something that uh, stands to the testimony of, again, his leadership and his faithful service as a servant of Jesus Christ. As Bernadette said, if God hadn't called Stephen into pastoral ministry, he would have been a politician. Um, his deep love of history uh, oozed out of every pore and oozed into the political arena. And I have had many talks over the years with Stephen about politics. And I've often wished that Stephen had been a politician, particularly a northern politician, because then we might have had some sense talk instead of so much of the nonsense that we've heard from both sides in the north over the years. Because he was a man of perspective. He was a man who understood history and who understood the sweep of history. And as Stephen rightly pointed out too, understood our human frailty. Therefore, he was no ideologue. He had no time for ideologies because politics either was pragmatic and honest with integrity or it was not worth the candle. And many times we discussed what was going on in the North and I know I learned a lot from Stephen, not just about Irish politics, but about politics in general. But that wasn't his calling. His calling, his vocation was to become a servant of Christ in this place and to serve this community and to serve many other people beyond this community. And that's a ministry and a vocation that he is charged with great honor and with great integrity. He was indeed truly a man of deep faith in every sense. His own personal faith in Christ, his faith that God knew what he was doing with his church and the privilege of being part of that, and his faith to lead people into new ventures. Well, as Paul said, Paul was confident that he who began a good work in the church in Philippi would carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And he who began a good work in Stephen carried it on to completion. And the last word we must talk about every time we talk about Stephen is not Stephen, it is Jesus, the one he loved and the one he served. so much more than a pastor to me. He was my mentor and one of my greatest friends. He was there for all, one of the darkest and any of the darkest hours in my life. And he was there for the happiest moments too. He's the one who performed my baptism behind you here in this tank in 2000. And he was the one who officiated my wife and I's wedding in 2019. Um, I simply would not be the man I am today without Stephen's ministry. I just wouldn't be the person I am. And it was the fact that I had, had his ministry and the blessing of having sat under his ministry for 24 years that made me the person I am. So when I first met Stephen, he picked me and my brother Garoud up in Castlevania. We were looking for, I was looking for a new church and the Lord had seen and shown me that the place where I was was not where he wanted me to be. And Gerald called Stephen. Stephen, as generous as ever, um, was heading into church. And he said to Gerald, meet me in the village and I'll pick you up there and bring you to church. So we arrived here and he brought us here on the evening, in the evening service on the first Sunday of 2000. A number of months later, he took me through baptism studies. We went, we met for coffee. We went and sat together in so many places, um, talking through the doctrines of grace, talking through the major doctrines of the church. And I learned so much from Stephen from those conversations. Learned how to ba base my faith on the, on the scriptures and the convictions that, are, that were brought to my mind of the doctrines of grace. I knew this was the church that the Lord had brought me to. I knew this was the church that the Lord, that I could call my home and where I could feel at home. And I knew that Stephen was the best example and he was always there with a firm handshake or a hand on the shoulder 
when we needed it most. He was there all the time. We spent many memorable journeys together and his generosity knew no bounds. It's a privilege that I have and I will always cherish to have been able to call him my friend and my pastor. My brother sent me this poem by Matthew Henry when he heard of Stephen's passing. And I'd like to read it for you now because I believe it sums up the thoughts we all have today as we send Stephen on his uh, eternal journey. <coughs> Matthew Henry wrote, Weep not for me. Would you like to know where I am? I am at home in my father's house, in the mansion prepared for me there. I am where I would be, no longer on the stormy sea, but in the safe and quiet harbour. My working time is done and I am resting. Would you know how it is with me? I am made perfect in holiness. Grace is swallowed up in glory. Faith no longer hopes, but sees. Mortality has given way to life as it was meant to be. Would you know what I am doing? I see God. I see him as he is. Not as through a glass darkly, but face to face. And the sight is transforming. It makes me like him. I am in the sweet enjoyment of my blessed Redeemer. I am here singing hallelujahs incessantly to him, who sits upon the throne, and I rest not day or night from praising him. Would you know what company I keep? Blessed company. Better than the best of the earth. Here are holy angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. I am set down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the saints. Would you know how long this is to continue? It is the dawn that never withers, the crown of glory that fades not away. After millions and millions of ages, it will be as fresh as it is now, and therefore weep not for me. Thank you very much. Gavin, a member of Dundalk Baptist Church, is going to come up now and read from Revelation 21. <clears throat> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. We're going to stand and sing another song. This song is called Abide With Me.
take your seats. At uh, this time, Stephen's son Daniel is going to come up and say a few words. So Stephen and my Aunt Burnett did an amazing job of capturing Dad's qualities as a, a brother, a father, and a pastor. But uh, I'm going to sing a song in a little bit, but I, I wanted to briefly discuss uh, the message, I suppose, that Dad tried to impress on everyone he met, uh, but specifically in his last days. Everyone has told me over the last week, both at the hospital and, and at the wake, that he was a man of faith. But I want to make sure everyone understands what that meant to him. This faith that he had was placed in a God who created the universe, the, the one who chose to live and die as one of us uh, because he loved us despite of ourselves. So when we say he had faith, his faith wasn't some vague hope that God could cure him of cancer. He knew God could cure him if that was God, uh, that if that was what God had planned. This man had seen and experienced the power of God changing people's lives time and time again over the years. Many of you who are sitting in this room or watching online today were those, those people. His faith, this faith we all speak of, was the faith uh, that while God may decide not to, to cure him, God was still in control and this was part of his plan. We all hope that situations will turn in our favor and we hope that God will hear and answer our prayers according to our plans. But it takes faith to trust in God when he tells us no. It takes faith to trust that his plans are greater than ours. Especially when these, especially when these plans go against every instinct in our body for for self-preservation. That's the faith that he had. And that's the faith that I strive for. But his faith, his faith reached beyond this mortal world. The peace he showed at the end was because he didn't trust in his own good works. His faith was anchored in what Jesus did for him. And thankfully, that is a faith I have. And it's God that receives glory for that. But he used this servant, Dad, to teach me these lessons. Now, this song we're about to sing conveys that message better than I can, and it's one that has comforted me over the past few weeks. And it's one that I want to share with everyone. Of course, Stephen Byrne had been sensible, just decided to speak, I said to, to sing. Poor, poor decision, really, but um, we'll... Uh, Give me a minute and get myself together and then uh, hopefully you enjoy the song. Good thing, little thing. 
2008, he was kind enough to let a young, crazy American stay at his house and learn about the spiritual climate of Ireland. And I went back to America thinking uh, that this was just a fun trip, but little did I know that four years later, Stephen would send me an email in 2012 and ask if I wanted to move to Ireland to work alongside the Dock Baptist Church. And after much prayer and discussion with my wife, we decided that this is where the Lord was leading us. And so we've now been in Ireland for nine years, and seven of those years have been spent working alongside Stephen as his co-pastor. And almost every week for seven years, we met together and talked. And you meet with someone that often, you get to know them. I learned many things about Stephen over those years. First, he loved his family. He spoke about his kids and his grandkids. He talked about the things that he and Marie had done and places they had visited together. He loved his family. Second, as has been mentioned many times now, he loved politics. Stephen was extremely knowledgeable about politics from all over the world. I didn't even have to read the news anymore because I would just ask Stephen what's going on in the world and then for a couple minutes every week I had my own personal news anchor who could expertly comment on all world events. During one of the last times I visited him in the hospital, he asked, so what's going on in the world? I told him, well, God is still in control. And he smiled and said, yes. Third, as has already been said, he loved history. His knowledge of history was amazing, particularly American history. 
I remember many years ago, we were having a men's meeting for the church, and at the end, someone asked a question about the American Civil War, and as the token American in the group, I gave a brief answer, and Stephen asked if he could get up and just say a little bit about it as well. <laughs> and then for 20 minutes, off the top of his head, he talked about the U.S. Civil War, the routes that certain armies had to take, where the battles were located, the effects of those battles, and how it impacted other events. And I quickly realized I should not be answering questions about the history of my own country. <laughs> because Stephen obviously knew a hundred times more than I did. Fourth, he loved the church. He loved serving the church. And he loved just meeting with people. Fifth, he loved his Savior. And this was primary in his life. He never said... Your marriage could be better. Your relationship with your kids could be better if you just acted like me. He never said that. He pointed people to Jesus and said, be like him. He never wanted to be the center stage so that people would exalt him for how much he knew about history or politics. It was always redirected to Jesus to remind people that he is the one who is ruling and reigning. He didn't want anyone to think that he was some holy man. He constantly reminded everyone that he was a sinner just like everyone else. And that all that he is and all that he was, he owed to Jesus. He wanted to magnify Jesus with his life. And I know for certain that he would want to magnify Jesus in his death. And so for just a minute, I want to tell you not about Stephen. Many of you have known him far longer than I have. I want to tell you about Stephen's Lord. And so I would like to read to you one verse from the Apostle Peter. One verse that Dundalk Baptist Church should know very well because I say this as often as I get the chance. It's the verse that if you could listen to the beat of my heart, each beat would reverberate with 1 Peter 3.18. This is what Peter writes. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. There's so much in those few words. And so for just a few minutes, I want to unpack those words and, and hopefully show you that the gospel, the good news that the Bible lays out, is the means by which we can have overflowing joy right now, even in the midst of sorrow, and have even greater joy in death. <coughs> Peter starts off by saying, Christ suffered for sins. He suffered to the point of death. The question is why? Why? Why did it have to be this way? And the answer, to put it succinctly, is because God is holy and you are not. My friends, I know to many of you those are just words, but I want you to, to just ponder what that might mean for just a minute. I want you to feel the weight of of that because eternity hangs on the balance. The God who created the heavens and the earth, who created you, is absolutely and perfectly holy. Language fails to describe and define the reality of God's holiness. It would be like trying to describe the overwhelming radiance of the sun to somebody who is blind. But in an attempt to at least trace the edges of the undefinable, we might say it this way. God's holiness is the summation of all of his perfect attributes. The magnitude of the greatness of God is immeasurable. His character is impeachable. He is morally pure. He is of infinite value. He delights in what is good and he abhors evil. The prophet Habakkuk wrote this in, in Habakkuk 1, verse 13. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrong. And therein lies the problem. You see, everyone here, you and me, every friend you have, every relative you know, every stranger you meet in this country and across the globe, has a heart stained with sin. 
It is a heart that delights in things rather than God. It is a heart that says, look at me. Look at, look at how great I am. Rather than saying, behold our God. Look at his holiness. Look at his glory. Come, let us adore him. Now make no mistake. Every person is religious. There is no such thing as a non-religious person because everybody worships something. Whatever holds the prime seat of your affections is your God. It could be the pursuit of fame, marriage, wealth, kids, power, family, sex, food, intellect, the advancement of your political views, to be loved, happiness, or a thousand other things. If the ultimate desires of your heart are clinging to anything other than God in Christ, then you're hugging an idol. And it is sin, which means that you and me are sinners. Being a pastor does not make you more holy. It does not make you less sinful than anyone else. I am a sinner. You can ask my wife. <laughs> Stephen was a sinner. And we know because he died. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 5 and verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. And so don't lie to yourself. That you are not a sinner. Death stares you in the face every day pointing you to this fact. And so we have these two important truths. God is holy. He abhors evil. And will not tolerate what is sinful. Yet you and I are sinners. Who have a happy, nice, respectable looking exterior. And yet our core is corrupt and sinful because we do not love God like we ought. We do not bow the knee to Him. And we replace Him with that which is non-God. Therefore, when we stand before God, He will make a declaration. And He will say, you are a sinner, and you won't be able to deny it. He will say, you didn't fear me. You didn't love me. Therefore, guilty. Is, is there not a way to have these sins we've committed forgiven? Is there not a way for every lie we've told, every mean word that has left our mouth, every unkind thought we've ever had, every detestation of God we've ever held in our heart, can it be paid for? Can we not be reconciled to God? This is why the gospel, which means good news, is such good news because the answer is yes. It is yes. The answer is what we read in 1 Peter 3. Christ also suffered for sins. You see, God's solution to the problem of my sin and your sin was not to make you work for it. Well, go do better. You know why? Because you can't. You can't. You would always Failed. Instead, God himself, the second person of the Trinity, entered into his own creation in the person of Jesus. And unlike you and me, he never sinned. He perfectly obeyed, delighted in his Father. And when he died, it was not just another death, but it was a sacrifice, a substitutionary sacrifice. And this is why Peter can go on to say what he says next. The righteous for the unrighteous. Ever there were words to delight your soul. These are those words. The righteous for the unrighteous. The just for the unjust. What does that mean? It means that the righteous and just Jesus stood in the place of the unrighteous and unjust sinner. In Jesus' death, he bore on his body the wrath of God due to sinners. He took the punishment. He bore the wrath. But the only way that Jesus stands in your place is if you believe, is if you trust in him. Listen to these words by the Apostle Paul who wrote to the Christians in the Greek city of Corinth. He says, for he, that is God the Father, 
made him, that is Jesus, the Son, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that's for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, a change has taken place. A, a substitution has taken place. Jesus knew no sin, and yet the sin of all those who believe on him was credited to his account. So that when Jesus died, it was your death. It was your punishment, if you believe. But there's also this little word that we can't skip over here. It says once. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. You see, there need not be any other sacrifice because his was perfect. It cannot be redone, represented, or repeated. It is absolutely sufficient to accomplish the thing it was meant to do. The author of the book of Hebrews said it this way in Hebrews 10, 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God because the work is complete. It's done. You cannot add to it. And you cannot think, well, I'm basically a good person. I've done all of these good things. That should be enough. <clears throat> it is Christ or nothing. That's the option. The same author goes on to say a few verses later, where there is forgiveness, there is no longer any offering for sin. So forgiveness has been secured. Reconciliation between the sinner and God has taken place, and all of it in Jesus. He is the one who died. He is the one who sacrificed himself. He is the one who bore the wrath of God on his body. He is the one who procured the forgiveness of our sins. He is the one who provides the basis of our justification. He is the one who takes away our condemnation. He is the one who reconciles us to God. Christ's sacrifice, his death, was sufficient to perfectly accomplish all of those things. It is entirely Christ alone. The question now is, well, to what end? The answer to that brings us to this last point here in 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. This is the very, very heart of all of this. You see, the greatest good of the good news, of the gospel, is you get God. You get the only being in the entire universe that can actually satisfy the longing of your soul. If all the elements of the gospel that I've mentioned don't lead to him, then it's not a gospel. It's not good news. Many people want to embrace the good news without embracing God. Many will, will say they believe that it means they get to escape hell, but, but, but they don't want any of this God business. You missed the point. Why was Stephen not worried about death? Why is it that Marie and Stephen and Daniel can rejoice even in the midst of sorrow? Because Stephen believed the gospel with all of his heart. And he knew that the moment his eyes closed in this life, it was instant and glorious gain because he beholds his Savior. He got Jesus. exactly what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 1. He writes, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I love that verse. Because you read it and you think, Paul, you're insane. What do you, what do you mean? You're stuck in a cold, dark prison. I remember this is around 60 AD, and Paul writes this from prison. And this was not a prison with a nice bed and a TV and a workout room. It's this cold, dark misery. And Paul says, look, if, if living will bring God glory, then I will live for him. If dying will bring God glory, let me die. Because for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. It's that last part that people find hard to believe. 
Because how can death be gain? You're sitting here, looking at Stephen in this coffin, and for many of you, you might be thinking, this was unfair. This was undeserved. Poor Stephen worked so hard serving in a church, serving in his community, and now he's lost it all. All that he's worked for is just gone. But I implore you to hear what God has said in, in, in the Bible. Stephen has lost nothing. He is more gloriously happy than the most joyful moment he ever experienced on earth because he gets Jesus. This is why death is gained for the believer. He trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and the whole trajectory of the gospel is working in his life, working out in his life was so that he might get to the very delight of his heart, which was his Savior. His death was not unfair treatment. He served God for 35 years, and then God said, well done, good and faithful servant. Come get your reward. There is no reward on earth that matches what he just got. As much as he loved his family, as much as he loved the church, as much as he enjoyed politics and history, having been in the presence of his Savior for the past few days now, where there is unending delight, he would not come back if he begged to. <laughs> My friends, just because someone dies, does not mean they get instant happiness. Hell is real as certain as heaven is. The good news of the Bible is that the holy and just God will look at you and declare you not guilty of your sins because Jesus suffered once for sins, the righteous one for the unrighteous ones. But you must believe. You must trust in him because Christ has done it all for you. All you bring is sin. Believe on him and you will be saved. Saved from sin, saved from the wrath of God, so that he might bring you to God in whose presence there is fullness of joy and at whose right hand are pleasures forevermore. The last sermon Stephen ever preached was on October 15th, just two months ago. And the subject was that our salvation depends on nothing but Christ alone. And so I think it's only fitting to give Stephen the last word. How did Herod only do Herod? Are you trusting in Christ alone? Not do you believe as a theory that Christ alone is the only way, but are you? I was asked you to use your imagination for a moment. Imagine that suddenly all these seats were empty, and the temple itself was empty, and there's only you and Christ in this building. Would you come and fall at his feet and say, I'm trusting in you alone? That's what true faith is. I believe that God sent you alone for me. Regardless of what I believed before, regardless of what I want to believe now, Regardless of what it costs me in family or friends or fame or fortune or anything, Jesus, I'm trusting in you alone because you alone can save me. You alone can keep me. You alone are my Savior. Let me ask that we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would help every single person here to trust in Christ alone. We pray that the funeral of Stephen would be the salvation of many. 
that they would see in his life, not that he was the great man who could save people from their sin, but he was the one who pointed people to the Savior who did that. Let no one leave here unaffected by what Christ has done for us. And may we give you glory all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In just a second, we're going to stand and sing our final song. And after it is over, I'm going to ask that you would remain standing as they come and take Stephen out. He will be followed by his family. And after they leave, I ask that you just remain standing here for just a minute uh, so I can give you a, a quick announcement. But we're going to stand and sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.